Uh, e desculpe, desculpe porque eu não falo português. <laughs> uh, that means I have to continue in English, sorry. Uh, but you mentioned this is the language in our lab. Maybe English men do not feel that that what we speak is really English. But it is a language that makes it possible that people from different countries find a unique kind of language, and we do not have so much fun when Americans or Englishmen come in, then they always say, okay, this is a kind of English, but not English. But it helps us to understand. Uh, I'm very happy to be again here in San Carlos. This is not the first time, not the second time, but it's the first time that I give a talk that has nothing to do with nuclear chemistry, nothing to do with radioactivity. It has just to do with inorganic chemistry. And even when the title focuses to tellurium and supramolecular assemblies, this is a kind of devotion to the modern way of giving uh, talks names. What I'm speaking about is general chemistry, coordination chemistry. And you will see, we will visit a big amount of elements in the periodic table, and they do not just belong to tellurium and some other metals. You see a whole series of lanthanides will be visited today, but also some transition metals. I gave this name <clears throat> since we start with small oligonuclear compounds that we indeed want to condensate later to supramolecules. But we do not want to make it in a way that we call, or that is called, self-organization. I think after 20 or 30 years using this name, it comes the time that we should take it into our hand to organize the things, since self-organization is everything. Any sodium chloride crystal is the result of a self-organization. We as a chemist should try to understand some mechanisms to organize the smaller unit to bigger ones. This is a big challenge, and we did not solve this problem. Unfortunately, not yet. Uh, but we should take this challenge and say, let's look into the mechanisms, let's start with very simple general concepts which are accepted within the inorganic chemists that we can use to organize small units to bigger ones. One concept is this type of crystal, or, uh, crystal organization, crystal design. In principle, it is a molecular design and the crystallization helps us. So, I'm very glad to uh, show you to introduce here in San Carlos some of our results in this direction, non-nuclear chemistry at all, today. Before I come to the chemistry, I want to introduce some people to you, since at the end of the talk, the time is always too late, we have to hurry, so it is worth to spend two minutes with these young guys who invested a lot of time, a lot of their work, to produce the result, I have the pleasure here to present. Uh, this is the privilege of a professor. They go to the lab and make the work, and I go to the plane and go to Brazil. This is not fair. So let me start with a Brazilian guy. A sailor uh, originally comes from Rio Grande do Sul, from Ernesto Schulz Lang's group. He is now professor in Bahia in Ileos, and he did the work about tellurium chemistry. This is not a big surprise, since he comes from a tellurium group. And uh, this is just the entry into this uh, chemistry, since some other guys from our group have worked together with, with Seiler. He was in Germany for one year. 
and invested a lot of time, not just during the week, also during the weekends. This is the way how Brazilians work. And uh, always the people say the Germans work hard. This is not true. When I came in at the weekend to the lab, I met Seiler. I met our Vietnamese guy, Hui. And sometimes I met, I met Abdullah. I never met the German co-workers. So is the work in Germany. The second guy, I already mentioned his name, is Abdullah. He comes from Syria. He made a master thesis in our lab and worked with the mercury chemistry I will introduce. Jacob Czekatish comes from Sri Lanka. Probably you do not remember this flag here. And so he made the chemistry about the lanthanide chemistry uh, with the lanthanides and with the coordination chemistry of transition metals. Let me say the father of this chemistry is Hui, Nguyen Huyn Hui, a Vietnamese PhD student uh, some years ago from my group. He also visited San Carlos. He enjoyed the Brazilian meat very much, since you must know Vietnamese like meat. They eat everything. And here you do not just receive everything, here you receive high quality meat. So he was very happy to work here, to meet the young people here, and to eat kilogram amounts of meat. Now he's back to Vietnam and sent me three years later one of his students, Pham, uh, for a PhD. So we are now with Vietnam in the second generation and he works with the catechol type uh, chemistry that I will introduce. This international team had some support from two Germans. This is Axel. Uh, who, comes from, who worked one year as a postdoc in our group. And this is Adelheid Hagenbach. Also, she has visited uh, San Carlos before, and she will return to Brazil this year. Unfortunately, not to San Carlos. She made most of the crystal structures, or she helped with almost all crystal structures. I will introduce during the next uh, couple of minutes. Let's come to the chemical part of the talk, and I will start with a really old statement from 1903, 20 years ago, and it uh, comes from Jean-Marie Lehn, who defined a kind of supramolecular chemistry. He wrote, supramolecular chemistry focuses on chemical systems made up of discrete numbers of assembled molecular subunits. The forces responsible for the spatial organization may vary from weak intermolecular forces, electrostatic or hydrogen bonding, to strong covalent bonding. And when I highlight some of uh, his words, we need small chemical systems, molecular subunits, and have to organize them in a spatial organization. Then we have finally also the concept for the next one hour. Since when we translate these words, well said for science, uh, into our trivial words, then it does meet, uh, then it means when we want to control supramolecular chemical systems, we have to control the size of the building blocks, the shape of the building blocks, the forces exerted from the building blocks, weak or strong, and finally also the number of the building blocks, which can be organized in this spatial way by, the, by these forces. Let me start with a Brazilian example that simply just might say, it is not enough to know the small building blocks. It is also necessary to know what must be in to form a unique result, a desired result. Of course, this is a kind of fun. But it might describe what I mean with the small to the big building blocks. Any one of us has tried this. This is Caipirinha. 
And of course, you all know how caipirinha is made. What do you need to make caipirinha? You need sugar, you need limes, you need ice, and you need cachaça. But when you look to the internet, when you look to some receipt books, you find different ways how to make caipirinha, and no one really describes what is the correct way. Let, let me start with the sugar. The sugar is a big issue in Europe. In Europe, you will always find caipirinha made from brown sugarcane sugar. This is sold in Europe with the tenfold price of the normal sugar. Sometimes it is artificially produced, since it's too expensive to import, just to make it brown. The US Brazilian know, in principle, this does not play a role. You can make sugar in the much more smart way. Use the sugar that you have. Use finely powdered sugar. It has a big advantage. It, is, it dissolves easier, and for Brazilian, it's important to have a lot of sugar in. So, in principle, the European statement, we need the brown sugar, is nonsense, since any of this sugar is just one molecule, saccharose. And whatever sugar you need, uh, you use, it will produce a tasty caipirinha. It doesn't look a little different, but the caipirinha result is the same. This is not the case with the fruits. In Brazil, this is not a problem. In Brazil, you have the majority of, of lemons simply in this Brazilian limes, the green ones. And then you want in Europe, find a cheaper solution. Nowadays, you can also buy the limes in Europe. But when you want to make the cheaper solution and you take the yellow German lemons, Italian lemons, then it doesn't work. You produce a drink, but you not produce caipirinha. And this has chemical reasons. This has chemical reasons since most of the contents of the shell of these fruits are the same. You have a lot of terpenes inside, but the content, the number of the compounds and the extent uh, and the content of one compound is different. This is fentyone. Fenchone is in a big amount contained in your limes, but not in the lemons. To make a caipirinha, it is not the same which lemons you use, since the chemistry says it might be good to stay with the Brazilian suggestion, use limes. What is with the ice? Ice is ice. Ice is frozen water, you might think. And this is true. Uh, but this is a kind of experiment that Germans have made, that we have made, uh, but uh, forced by a Brazilian guy. Uh, the first caipirinha I had the pleasure to enjoy, I drank in the 90s. In the 90s, it was almost impossible in Germany to buy limes and to buy cachaça. So that time, Two Brazilians were in Tübingen as PhD students. Now they are professors in Brazil. And the first year, Ernesto brought a, a bottle of cachaça, Ipioca. This bottle had a half-life of one year. Since any new visitor get one glass, he tested and said, OK, thank you, nice drink. Do you want another? No. One year half-life. After one year, they moved back to Brazil, came back to Germany, and brought the next bottle of Ipioca, but some kilograms of limes. What do you think how long survived the second bottle? Not one week. Then it was empty, since the limes helped to make caipirinha. And now let's come back to the ice. And then we experimented with the ice. And this is not innocent. You can dry it yourself. You are chemists, you have access to liquid nitrogen. We did not just use the ice from the freezer, since you know in Germany the safety regulations, we cannot take the ice of our lab freezer. So we made the ice in another way. We made it with liquid nitrogen. 
Of course, the structure of ice, the composition of ice is the same. It is water. But the temperature is much lower, and this also lowers the temperature of the Caipirinha. And with this, it influences our receptors in the mouth. And when you use deep frozen ice, the taste of Caipirinha is different. You drink Caipirinha as a long drink, but when you make it with the deep frozen ice, you can use so much spirit that you can drink it as a short drink with the same taste, but completely different to the long drink. Thank you.